Good evening, everybody. It's Mario with Motorcycle Knuckle Busters. We're back at it again. Got another awesome show. Great guest. Um, want to remind everybody, get a chance. You know, obviously, you can follow, find us on Facebook, Google, uh, Spotify, iTunes. Um, check us out. YouTube, subscribe. You know, get our episodes, get past episodes, everything else. So, there's a lot that's getting ready to start firing up. You know, we are in the throes of motorcycle seasons. You know, we've got big rallies coming up. We've got summer. Everybody's out there riding and everything. And our next guest, uh, I want to bring on this guy. Let me tell you what. He he is the motorcycle world. He has become the gold standard, I think, in this industry. Uh, a lot of us, when we got familiar with him, he was kind of the young buck that was on the corner. But now he is... He is one of the patriarchs of this industry and uh, will be for years. Um, he's done a, he's done a lot for the industry. He's done a lot for all of us. He's entertained a lot of us. And uh, he's just a solid, solid guy. And I'm very proud that we got him on here. So without further ado, here's Billy Lane. Hey, Mario. Thanks for the nice introduction. I appreciate that. Oh, man, it's heartfelt. So, I mean, that doesn't, uh, you know, watched your career, watched you, all the things you do, you know, for years and years, you know, and it's kind of exciting because, you know, we got, we can talk about the past, we can talk about the present, and we can talk about the future when it comes to you. I've been doing this, uh, next year will be 35 years that I've been doing that. I haven't done anything else for a living for 35 years next year. That's, you know, that's amazing. You know, that's, that's, that's a career. And I mean, 35 yeah. years and you're still, you know, by standards, you know, look at Mondo, the way he's still going. I mean, yeah. so if you hit, you know, you know, you're going to be Mondo and you're going to be 50 plus years and still going strong. And the thing is, I watch Mondo. He doesn't slow down. I watch you. You don't slow down. You watch Aaron Green, different guys like that. Don't slow down. Yeah. You know, I'm Mondo's. Yeah. I, I, most of my friends are older than me. They always have been, even when I was younger. Um, you know, the guys that I was hanging out with when I was a teenager and riding were, you know, they were in their 40s. They were all club guys. And, you know, so I was brought up around that. I always watched older guys that I admired and watched what they did. And Mondo's one of them, you know, Indian Larry was one of them. Um, yep. Arlen Ness, Parowitz, Donnie Smith, you know, all these guys, um, like a sugar bear. You yeah. know, like how long he's been doing it. And uh, watched a lot of these guys and, watch what they did and what they didn't do and um and that's i think a part of the, the longevity that i've had is that you know like a guy like mondo is still doing it i'm gonna be doing this when i'm his age you know i get my kids are so young that i'm gonna be doing this for another 25 years at least just to you know keep the wheels on the on the carriage you know <laughs> yeah no kidding well speaking of which i mean now you've got a son on the way right i just yeah we just found out we have a son on the way i mean we knew she was pregnant but we just found out it's a boy yesterday we kind of knew that's why we were going to hold them out to find out. And um, we just, we were already kind of knew because we saw the ultrasound pictures we weren't supposed to see. So um, we just decided to kind of confirm it so we can make some plans. But yeah, we got a son coming. Congratulations. That's wonderful. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, the legacies that you are creating, it will be passed on and uh, hopefully keep that, keep that lane name going for years and years, right? Yeah, I mean, if the girls want to do it, you know, um, I'll, I'll, right now they're in the dolls and pink stuff. Um, yeah. You know, when they get older, <laughs> when they get older, you know, they're little. The oldest is old, will be six in uh, next month. So, you know, when they get older, if they want to be a part of this, I'll definitely turn Heck them on. Yeah. And if the boy doesn't want to be a part of it, you know, um, I'll be okay with me too. I mean, at that point, I'm gonna be so old, I'm not gonna care about much. But, you know, the, sure. The, well, you know, and that's awesome when you know, mention the girls, because look at Dave and Jody. I mean, what a legacy there and, and passing the torch, you know, and, you know, Dave's still going strong, obviously, and everything else. And I had a young girl, Mondo, you know, Mondo got to meet her. We had her at the Chopper show last year. You know, she started building her Chopper when she was 12. And yeah. uh, there she was 14 years old showing that bike. And she was she brought a lot of hardware home. So now it's kind of. It's kind of interesting, you know. I, I saw this thing on your website, and it says your parents didn't allow, you know, uh, long hair, tattoos, motorcycles. Yeah. So, so how did Billy Lane then come about like this? 
I mean, you know, I wasn't good at listening, I guess. I mean, um, you know, that it, it's really true. I mean, they were so against motorcycles, um, even dirt bikes. We had to sneak out and ride dirt bikes and ATCs, you know, three-wheel ATCs in the 70s when I was a kid. And um, they were really, really against it. We, They had some friends that got in a bad motorcycle accident. And I had a friend that um, sure. when I was, I think, probably sixth grade, was riding on the back of a motorcycle with his brother. And they got a really bad accident right around the corner from our house. And he was in a coma for almost a year and really never the same after that. So my parents were scared of him. And, um, but, you know, we grew up in the seventies. We were watching on any Sunday, um, you know, and, and the wide world of sports when it would come sure. on and have motorcycle racing and the, all the evil Knievel stuff that happened in the seventies. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, it, it was pretty hard for them to try and keep us from that. Yeah, I, I mean, back there in the wild world of sports, he used to love that. He used to have the big buildups, the Evo Knievel out in front of Caesars and different places yeah. like that, getting ready to do a jump. That was the best stuff. All right. And then you went out there with your little Evo Knievel toy doing jumps, yeah. you know, out in the yard and stuff, you know. But, yeah, that, that was good stuff. So um, who, is, who is the biggest troublemaker, you or your brother? Probably me, I guess. I mean, um yeah, yeah, I, I hell raised them pretty bad. I, I watch it with my kids now. I see how my younger daughters hell raised the older one. And yeah, um, did that to my brother <laughs> quite a bit. I mean, uh, I learned how to get my ass beat early, you know, and uh, how to get my revenge early. But um, yeah, yeah, I was, I was, I was pretty. My mom said I was a pretty wild kid. Yeah, I caused the most grief in my family too. So uh, you know, God bless my parents for all of. Yeah, the stuff I put them through. So, you know, one thing, you know, I don't think a lot of people, you know, people think of you, obviously, you know, you've, you've done the biker build off show. Um, you've, you've had your own show, you know, blood, you know, sweat and gears. Um, you've had a lot of different appearances with various things and stuff like that. And people think of, of you know, you as a builder, but you know, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, you got an associate's degree from Florida State and you got your bachelor's degree from uh, Florida International, right? Right. So how has that, how has that served you in this industry? I mean, it's, it's been great. You know, I, my parents like, wanted me to go to college. Um, you know, they worked really hard to get me there and I worked hard to get there. I, I wanted to go. But the, the problem was, is that like the summer before I was leaving to go to college, um, my brother and my dad, they were, they were restoring Corvettes in South Beach, Miami. And, um, these Europeans were all vacationing in South Beach, uh, you know, every winter and were buying Corvettes and exporting them back to Europe. Yep. <coughs> Excuse me. And then they started wanting to export Harleys. And so we started working on the Harleys and mostly panheads and knuckleheads, older stuff back then. And, uh, you know, next thing you know, I got hooked on bikes. So I went to school. I told you my parents were ready to have motorcycles, but as soon as I got away from them, I, I bought a, a panhead, a 1950 panhead. Um, so I right away, you know, my even before my freshman year in college, but then my freshman year, I, I was hooked on that and doing that and um, started working on bikes. But, you know, I, I did go to school and I did earn the degrees, and it's been really helpful because engineering, they teach you how to learn. So I'm self-taught. Everything that I do, I'm self-taught. Um, I mean, I've had people guide me along the way, but I, I never took any courses. I didn't. I never been to a welding, a technical college, or welding school, or um, anything. I learned how to operate a milling machine and my lathe, and you know, my TIG welder, pretty much on my own. And you know, before YouTube and before Instagram, right. and before the internet. You know, um, this is in the '80s and the early '90s. And so really, really self-taught and, um, and that going to college taught me how to learn. And then also, you know, um, math is good for being in business. You know, I'm like pretty sure. smart. That's the, the one thing I think a lot of people don't realize, you know, you can be a great welder or fabricator, build great custom bikes. But if you have no business sense, you're not going to last long in this world. No, you're not. Especially not no, in this industry. I've seen all the talent in the world, but shit, there was not the business sense. And, you know, it just, it just didn't work. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I remember, I can't tell you, we were in Daytona one year and I remember Jesse James was there. This is in their, you know, um, late nineties. Jesse was there on, in force on main street. We were there 
um, and I don't even think any Larry had really come on yet, you know, as far as the public knowing who he was. And this company pulled in um, Hellbound Steel. I don't know if you remember Hellbound Steel. I think they were from Vegas. And uh, they pulled in, they had a like a Kenworth truck all wrapped and yep. like 40 custom bikes and everybody had a matching embroidered shirt. They had like a, you know, 20 by 80 foot display tent on Main Street. And I'm like, man, I tell you what, what right now, they better know something I don't know because you come rolling in like that, you know, you're spending more than you're making. And then the next year you don't see them, you know, um, or two years later they're gone. And that's how I see that happen a lot with people, you know, because they don't have the business sense. They think if you throw a bunch of money at it and there's some talent, it's going to work. And it takes so much more than that. Well, they get they get investors money. It's fool's gold in some ways, you know, and they don't appreciate it and, and utilize it in the right ways. You know, that's that's one thing. But yeah, you're right. I mean, how many times have you gone into Sturgis and see somebody make a big splash and the next year they're either, you know, barely there or they're not there at all. Yeah. And you see it and you just like you cringe, you're like, Oh man, there goes there goes somebody's life savings right out the window, you know. But um, so anyhow the, the college gave me a lot of business sense. Um you know what I mean? I didn't go to business school, but you know, I've read a lot of business books and talked to a lot of people who I've seen be successful in other industries and, um, you know, really tried to apply that to what I'm doing, you know, because the, the hardest part is finding a balance between the work and the business and then being happy doing it. I mean, it's really difficult, especially for this many years. Like, I'm still happy, you know, 35 years later, 34 years later, I'm still really happy coming to work every day. That's awesome. So yeah. Speaking about business, let's let's pop up a couple logos real quick. Uh, okay. So obviously, you know, the Chopper's Inc. still going, and you know, I think that's what everybody knows you, you know, knows you as. You know, right? It's either you know the two go synonymous or hand in hand. Um, what's the future plans with Chopper's Inc.? So I'm going to go back, and I'm still building a lot of choppers, and I haven't really been showing that lately, but it's just the the spot I'm in right now, but I'm still going to continue building a lot of choppers. I have six going here right now. Um, and I'm going to go back into parts manufacturing because that's ultimately what Choppers Inc. really was, was a parts business. Um, yes. And so I'm going to go back into that. I was hoping I'd be into it by now, but it's just the way everything is in the world right now. You know, you, you have to, you know, you're kind of um, a float on the sea. <laughs> you know, every, everything that's happening around you. So I'm just sure. trying to ride wave. But I'm going right. back in the parks business for sure with Chopper's Inc. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, I knew, uh, we talked about that a while back ago, and right. you've got a new place there. So that's 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 pretty exciting, and I'm sure people are going to be looking forward to that. So, And we'll make sure when you get that up, we'll share that on social media and push that out there for you as well. Now, I want to bring up the next thing, and I want to talk about this, all right? Because this, to me... This really speaks to my heart. Um, I, mean, I go to start, I go to, uh, I go to Meekum every year. Love Meekum. Love seeing the uh, love seeing the vintage stuff. Explain to everybody uh, the Cool Hand Speedco and what you're going to be doing there. Okay, so Cool Hand Speedco is something I'm so excited about. It's something I've been wanting to do for over 20 years, um, and finally got to the point to where if I don't do this now, when am I going to do it? Uh, but. Uh, I've always wanted to kind of manufacture my own motorcycles, but you know, I didn't want to just do what everybody else did, which is take an Evo engine and put it in something else and, you know, slap some paint and a logo on it and call it a new, a new motorcycle. So I'm kind of mimicking what Al Crocker did in the thirties and forties. And for those who don't know, you know, a Crocker motorcycle was made by Al Crocker and Paul Bigsby yeah. and um, they're made in Los Angeles and he only made less than a hundred motorcycles, but, um, about 60 road bikes and about 30 or 40 uh, single cylinder speedway race bikes. But he basically was an Indian dealer and um, started making his own modified versions of Indians and then started making his own motorcycles uh, really that were revolutionary. And I'm kind of, they were. yeah, they were, you know, I mean, if it wasn't for, if it wasn't for people who don't know, if it wasn't for Al Crocker, we'd probably all still be riding flatheads because, you know, the Crocker is what really, made a harley you know indian never made an overhead valve motorcycle production bike they all they indian made flatheads until the day they went out of business and yep. 
and they were doing well. Um, they, you know, the reason they went out of business because they tried to do four cylinder motorcycles, but um, India was continuing to make flatheads and Harley probably would have, but they were scared of what Al Crocker was doing with the overhead valve twins. And, um, yep. you know, and that's what really push the knucklehead onto the market in 1936. I mean, they were developing it. Harley was developing it. If it wasn't ready in 1936, it wasn't ready in 1937. Um, they put it on the market in 1936. And because of Crocker and then the knucklehead, you know, now we have, uh, you know, the Evo, you know, panhead, shovelhead, Evo, twin cam, and Mil uh, Milwaukee 8. But <laughs> that's what really drove in the United States overhead valve technology because we'd all be driving tractors still, you know, if it wasn't for – for Crocker. So anyway, you know, he was an overhead valve pioneer in the U.S. Um, and so that's what I'm doing. I'm taking Harley and Indian uh, V-twin engines from the 30s, 40s, and 50s and doing my own overhead valve conversion to them and then making a motorcycle around them that resembles what Al Crocker was building. You know, a bobber, which is a stripped down road motorcycle from the 40s. Yeah, I saw it a couple of years ago at Meekum, talking about Meekum. I think they, they had a 37 that was stripped down, was made for uh, racing. And they had a 39 that was just absolutely gorgeous. I believe it was 39. And that bike, I mean, it was just, it was not just the overhead valve and the, and the motor and the design, but the, the bike itself is aesthetically one of the most beautiful things you'll ever see. They're gorgeous. I have one, actually, I'm looking at it now. Um, it's a 41 and um, probably one of the last ever built in 41 Crocker. And it's just gorgeous, you know, and that's the thing is everybody who's ever seen mine, um, it's like, what is that? I, they don't know what it is. And I, I tell them and they're right. not familiar with it. And then like, God, I think so beautiful. And, you know, so here's the wrap is that um, everybody wants one, nobody can afford one. And even if they could afford one, there's no supply because they only made 60 or so of them. So I'm basically going to fill a little bit of a, a you know, supply problem there. Um, right. you know, I'm going to build 50 of these. And, um, you know, I'm well into, you know, I'm, I'm knocking on 10% of that right now. I got our little rescue cat here is trying to get up on the, if you knock that phone over, cat. <laughs> he's so mischievous. Um, but anyhow, uh, you know, I'm, oh, there she goes. So let me move this for a second. I'll show you the Crocker because we're standing here. But uh, yeah, let's see it. So I use a little probably backlight glare, but um, yeah, nice I mean, that, that's what I'm talking about. It's just absolutely gorgeous bike. I mean, you know, everybody's building bikes this to this day to kind of mimic that, and they don't even realize it. Yeah, it's such a great looking bike, and um, I so I've had this for over 20 years um and it's been in the same state for five years um, okay and I keep swearing, every christmas i'm going to give myself the christmas present of finishing it and then i don't um but i need to finish it this summer i want to bring it to sturgis because you know cool hand is really born from this so okay um, you know that's the thing is that because of that bike i decided i wanted to do cool hand i mean i been want to do it for as long as I've had the bike, um, you know, and, and I, you know, the thing was 20 years ago, no one really knew what was going to happen with Crockers. I mean, when I bought mine, I paid a lot of money for it, but it wasn't, I couldn't afford that bike in today's money. Um, no. but this was, again, was really before the internet was widely in use really before there was Google, there was no Google search and there was no YouTube and, um, there was no Meekum, I guess Meekum auctions were probably going on, but they weren't televised and, people weren't going crazy and spending all that money, you know, buy it, spend it 600,000 on a Crocker. I mean, mine's not worth that, but, um, you know, it's a great bike and, you know, it's mine. And, um, so, you know, it's really inspired me to do something else. And because, you know, I've got the point to where when I ride, if I ride something, people always say, Oh, I love that bike. And I realize not everybody can afford one of my customs. Yeah. And it's more on the level of affordability. And I'm using Harley and Indian bottom ends, so they have a Harley title and an Indian title. So you know, like um, I like I'm the first, the second one I'm finishing right now is a 1945 Indian. So it's you know, title is 1945 Indian, but it's a cool hand bike. You know, it's far superior to what Indian was building in 1945, and it's sure, cool. it's custom. And you know, when you pull up on that, I don't care if there's 
a beautiful restored or original paint knucklehead on either side of you, they're going to stop and look at the cool hand bike because it's so different and so unique. So are you going to be building these to order or building them in spec? Are you specking these? I mean, they're spec, yeah. But I, I, we went to Daytona and we had such a great response to them that we sold several. And right. now building to order instead of building. I mean, they're all going to be the same. But um, you know, the first, especially the first handful of people that are supporting what I'm doing, I want to make sure that they get something really special. And they're all going to be special. But you know, they're all hand numbered. Um, I'm hand building all of them myself. Uh, you know, hand building the frames. Um, you know, there, there's nothing like them. And, and then I'm doing no. a lot of little, little special detail features and things that, you know, I would give you as the owner to one that, you know, just would really, the kind of service that you don't get anymore when you buy something typically, you know, that's really what I want to offer. Sure. So, you know, so let's, when's the next time everybody's going to be able to see these? I think I know when, but let's tell everybody. Yeah, we're going to be interested just at the chip in, in August. Um, I'm going to have several of them with me there. Uh, you know, I'll be riding one around Sturgis. Um, hopefully I have my Crocker done and I'll have that too. And, and people will be able to yeah. see. People, this Crocker looks done, but if people will be able to see the, you know, really the bloodline um, for what I'm doing, where they're coming from. And so, yeah, so Sturgis is where we're going to be out next. We're out in Daytona Bike Week and I'm just trailing the gap between Ben and Sturgis getting some more bikes together. And so we, we should let people know you're going to be at the crossroads at the Buffalo chip. And right. so a lot of people don't go out to the Buffalo chip because they think they have to pay to get in. Crossroads yeah. is free. Right. It's free access park. You know, there's the big engine bars right there. You've got uh, usually got stud shows, usually wall of death is there, a bunch of different things. It's very, very cool. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, anybody can come out and see you. You don't need to be, they have a camp pass and stay in there at the chip. So, you know, I would encourage anybody that's going to be at Sturgis, get out there. Yeah, I, I definitely do. We, you know, we used to stay at the chip all the time and, um, you know, love it there. It's such a great experience and it's so different than everything that's going on downtown. And I know how it is during the day. Everybody wants to get out and ride around and, and do stuff, but the chip's a great place to come on wine in the afternoon, you know, well, we always yep. just get up in the morning and go ride, um, do whatever it is we want to do, and then come back in the afternoon and kind of find a place to chill. And you know, the great thing about the chip is you don't have to be staying there. If you come out there, and you're going to meet people that might be your friends for the rest of your life. It's just so many people there from so many walks of life, and you know, everybody's taking a week or two off from work to just blow off some steam and you know, do it with motorcycles. And so you can come out to the chip and check out what's going on, and then hang out there for the rest of the night. People will put you up and invite you in. You know, it's a really unique yep. place. Yeah, we do. We have, you know, that, that's been the experience I've had every year. I've got friends, you know, now it's like every, you're, you're returning to family. It's almost like a family reunion every year for me. So I know there's a couple of my buddies who are ex-seals and stuff like that are actually uh, looking forward to meeting you because you've been such a great supporter of the military. I mean, going yeah. back to when you were doing blood, blood, sweat, and gears, you know, that was, the, you were honoring military members. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was, that was 1995. It's hard to believe this almost 20 years ago, too, but um, that we did blood, sweat. No, not two, 2005, but still yeah. almost 20 years. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I that was such a great thing to do. I mean, I, you know, I did a USO tour in 2006, and it was amazing. And um, I still think, I think about it every day. That USO tour is, you know, something I'll never forget. And, um but yeah, you know, we're we're blessed, you know, to to be able to live the way we live because of you know our military. So I've always supported that. I always loved when I was in the service and being overseas when the USO tours would come around and, and the people that were always involved with that were always so genuine and appreciative towards us as as members of the military. I mean, I remember one time Randy Travis coming out and he was big at that time, you know, and yeah. He, you know, he came mess hall, sat down, he ate what we ate, hung out with us, you know, talked to us, you know, just just a genuine guy. And any, any of those folks that came out, you know, and, and you have no idea what that meant to all of us. I mean, and, and I got to thank you for, for all those to soldiers and, and those lives you touched because, man, that means a lot. Yeah, it was, I, I really, I'm telling you, one of the best experiences of my life was doing that, um, you know, 
I'd go back again in a heartbeat, you know, wherever. I mean, um, it was really, really great. I, I loved it. I met so many great people. Stay in contact with several of them still. Yeah, it's been been awesome. And then yeah, that's where the, the custom motorcycle world came from was returning veterans. I mean, yeah, it was where it all came from. So it all it all matters. Yeah, they had to do something with those military surplus uh, motorcycles, and guys did want them like that, you know. And they're, yeah. you know, that's where you know that's where we got started bobbing them out, and you know, eventually we got into the chopper culture. So a lot of folks don't realize that. So, you know, that's have, you know, what's that? I have a friend. He he just died a couple of years ago, but he was a World War II vet, and um, he he signed up, uh, falsified his document, signed up as a sixteen year old. And whenever he was in Germany, and um, he brought me, I have them, a handful, not a handful, like a small box full of black and white photos from after the war. He was in Germany for another year, and to him and riding around on all these 45s, you know, that these WLA 45s, and he just said they were everywhere, and they would just grab them and bob the fenders and riding them around and um, living it up in Germany because there was nothing to do, you know, and they were just still there until they got their. Uh, orders to come back home and just really cool photos. Yeah. The, the occupation guys afterwards, they didn't have a lot to do. And a lot of them, you know, it's go make sure somebody was staying in line and then go do whatever. So yeah. there's, I've heard some legendary stories about those guys. So that's, that is so cool. Yeah. My grandfather actually, um, he, uh, he drove ambulance and then was um, also drove a, to bring soldiers off front line, uh, Harleys and Indians, uh, where they had the single litter that was on the side, pulling one guy at a time from the front lines. Oh yeah. So, so to me, it's uh, it's kind of cool when I go riding and I think about what that must have been like for him and, and the experience that was. And oh yeah. So really cool. So that's you know that's something else I want to bring up. And I mean, we got some photos loaded up to get into, but I want to talk about. Billy the historian, because I, I don't think people understand the purest that you are. I mean, you love, absolutely love the history of motorcycles. You're like kind of a walking encyclopedia. Um, your knowledge is vast. It's very deep. Um, where did that where did that all begin for you? When did you start really getting into all the history? I mean, I've always really liked um, like I love bobbers from uh, the Danny Lyon photo crossing the Ohio River. Do you know the photo I'm, I'm talking yep. about? Yeah, I do. I don't yeah. know if a lot of people listening do, but it's a, a really great 1966 photo that Danny Lyon uh, took. He, he did a book called The Bike Riders. Um, he, was a, he was a Chicago outlaw. No, I think Danny Lyon was an Ohio outlaw. I'm not, I'm, I don't want to get the... the um, facts wrong on that, but he was an outlaw and he was doing really um, a lot of photo documentation of different things, the civil rights movement, and he was also yes. involved with the motorcycles. Um, but anyhow, he has a, a, took a photo of a outlaw in the 60s crossing the Ohio River on this you know, iron um, bridge and on this panhead bobber. And I remember seeing that as a kid. They used to sell that in Easy Rider magazine. Yep. Sell, print, sell prints of it, and I just love the look of that bike. And so I've always loved bobbers. And then, um, you know, uh, uh, and got into choppers. And then my, my brother, we went to a swap meet when we were kids, and my mom let him, my brother, buy a stack of like old Super Cycle and Easy Rider magazines. This is probably around 1980 or so. I was maybe 10. And my mom just thought there were motorcycle magazines. She didn't know there was nude women in them and all this other stuff. You know, they used to sell drug paraphernalia and everything else in there. And um, sure, yeah. yeah, so um, she didn't know. And so we were flipping through them and, you know, we, we didn't have access to, again, this is in the 70s and the early 80s. We didn't have access to what people have now. So we we're just looking through old magazines and then did more and more and more of that. And so I've always kind of looked back. Um, because I think it's because of the time I grew up. I was looking back at what people were doing before me. I think that's where the love of history came in. And then I became friends with Dale Waxler from Wheels Street mm -hmm. Time. And he was yeah. such a, you know, that guy, that guy was a, an encyclopedia. Um, and true. Learned a lot from him. And, and, and that's, like I said, I'm self-taught 
in my skill set. And the same with old motorcycles. I've never been afraid to walk up and ask somebody, hey, what, what is that? What's going on with that? Um, you know, to, to gain some knowledge you know, before you could Google search it, you know, because right. now everybody's Google smart. But, um, you know, so I just really always loved the history of bikes. And, and I think is I learned a lot about, you know, we were working on, so we were riding panheads and knuckleheads in the 90s because we couldn't afford what was new and current. And, and to ride one, you know, ride, especially a knucklehead, you had to really know what was going on with it. And you really had to ask an old timer kind of, Hey man, this thing yeah. is leaking so much oil or, you know, it's doing this, it's doing that. How do I fix that? And, and learn about those bikes. And it is, I would learn about everything I could learn about a pan or a knucklehead. I'd be like, well, what can I learn about something that was, you know, predated that. And so just, and I've been doing it long enough now that where I know what's going on with bikes from 1910. Yeah, that's 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 amazing, and I just I love the fact that you know you you have that knowledge and you share that knowledge, you have that passion for it because you know people uh, you know there's so many folks that you know and I don't begrudge you you ride you ride but you know they they jump on their new street glide and they take off but they don't realize the rich and vast history here they don't know about popes and 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 you know the, the crockers and all these various you know bikes that were out there were just magnificent you know pieces of machinery so yeah you know so, and i don't like the same as you i don't begrudge somebody like i meet somebody who's riding the honda shadow I, hey, hey listen why you're riding the honda shadow is none of my business you know i don't i don't really care like i'm in the i like sport bikes um like i think bmw probably makes some of the best motorcycles on the planet they do i don't, I don't ride one but i I appreciate what they are and um, you know, I've ridden all kind of stuff. So I don't really either judge somebody and I, and, and knowing all this kind of stuff isn't for everybody, you know, but for me, I mean, this is what I've done and it's my job to know, I think, you know what I mean? Like I, I think it's my yeah. job to know. Um, and I've gotten to work on some really great stuff because I know, you know, like I, I never imagined like owning a Crocker even, um, you know, or I'm like, actually I have my phone propped up on a, 1928 Henderson four right now, you know, which is yeah. I'm working on and it's like an amazing motorcycle. And, uh, you know, and I know you don't think I'm lying, but check it out. I mean, look at this. No, but you know, and that's I, exactly. I mean, look at that bike, the Hendersons and that, those fours were so cool. Yeah. That's a gorgeous bike. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. You know, and I'm, and I, I'm really lucky that I get to get to work on this stuff. You know, I, like I said to you earlier, and I still, it's still fun for me, um, you know, and it's, I think a lot of that has because, because I've, there's a variety of what I do. It's not just all the same thing over and over and over again. Um, you know, so yeah, the, but the history is a big part of it for sure. Uh, and I don't well, that's know. That's one of the things. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I, I, I don't, there's a lot I don't know. You know, I'm not trying to say I'm an expert cause I'm not, but I do have a good general knowledge of a lot of the history of, bikes and you know where they came from and especially race bikes well i was going to say one of the things i really like about going to mika each year in vegas is that i've always so love watching the guys that come down and they got the notepads and they're like this and they'll sit down in front of a bike that's either down the paddock or it's up top featured bike and they're just they're taking pictures or writing notes or taking pictures or writing notes because they may be seeing that bike for the first time. They got one that's torn apart in a garage and they yeah. want to put it together. Yeah. And to me, that's cool. That's oh, yeah. cool. They're studying, you know, and watch them guys study it and figured it all out. You know, that's, that's awesome stuff. Yeah. And I, I, I've done that too, you know, not more with a camera. I take a lot of pictures and I would go to a show or someplace and, you know, even go to wheels through time and talk to Dale, but I yeah. take pictures of stuff, you know, and figure things out and, figure out because there's a lot of this stuff there's really no compiled information anywhere like we race at sons of speed we race the harley jds and the indian power plus yep. and you know um the, like the headstrom indians and and there's nowhere you can go to get the information on those and you know we've learned a lot of it just by running them and racing them you know and um but and talking to people and taking pictures but i mean like you know now I, we were just at, we've had an event here in tennessee last weekend and um uh, one race team had a problem getting one of their bikes started and I walked up and I saw what was going on and I've been through that a million times what they were going through, you know, and, and, uh, 
and without stepping on anybody's toes, I was trying to help them get it going. But then I realized that, you know, they weren't asking for my help, <laughs> you know. So, but I, I learned so much from running them and being on the track that, um, and watch mistakes happen there and end up with other people that think they know. You know, if you think you know how to make a, a knucklehead run, you can't make a Harley JD run. They're two entirely different animals, even though they're of the same basic design, but. So let's talk, let's talk about the Sons of Speed because, you know, you just got done doing your first event in Tennessee. Um, yeah. You've been, you know, you've been doing Daytona. Okay. Um, explain to people, I mean, I know what it is. All right. But explain to those people out here that's going to watch us that maybe aren't familiar with what you do with Sons of Speed and, and everybody that's involved with that. From Mr. Banks to other people that uh, join you out there. Yep. So, um, excuse me for one second. My okay, my FedEx guy just came. I had to get my package. Um, sorry about that. Um, I want we're, we'll help you anytime. Go get that FedEx package. Maybe it's something exciting. I, I clean the toilets and I, I get the mail. Um, one man show. <laughs> so there you go. Is, is vintage motorcycle racing, vintage American motorcycle racing, and I started it because Daytona and Sturgis and Laconia, all those big events that we've all been going to for so many years all started out as motorcycle racing and then it turned into everything else kind of but that um even five seven years ago if you went to the daytona 200 there's nobody there you know at the, you're like what's daytona 200 well it's the the race that goes on during right. bike week so yeah um, and and then when it, when you are there it's kawasaki honda suzuki and yamaha you know there's no american motorcycles racing there except for when the Harley Davidson had the VR 1000 in for, you know, a right. few minutes. Um, so I started Sons of Speed because I wanted something to do with the bike events that was about American motorcycle racing and wasn't based around being a bar crawl, you know, or like a poser bike show or anything else. So that was the yeah. real reason for it. And then, of course, I love vintage stuff and I love racing and racing is really what created bobbers and choppers. So, you know, all the styling cues and everything we do in custom choppers and bobbers all comes from race bikes, you know, it's a derivative of that. So we started racing and we really were just originally racing board track bikes, you know, 1910, and 1929 Harley, Indian, Excelsior. Um, and, and then we brought in the 45 cubic inch bikes now, you know, from the 30s, 40s and 50s. Yeah. And um, it's really, really grown, and it's been it's been amazing. And um, you know, I never could have imagined what it would have turned into. Um, you know, it's uh, you know, so we race in Daytona twice a year, and um, we tried at Sturgis a few times. We're gonna try and do that again out in Sturgis, not this year, but we want to bring the racing back to Sturgis. But we got to get the track right. Um, the track's always an issue out there. And then we just did it sure. here in Tennessee. So you know, you talk about board track racing, and I. Man, if there was anything I could go back and see, I mean, that was the number one spectator sport in North oh, America yeah. For, yeah. for a good while. I mean, what I would do to be actually to go see that, can you imagine go back in time? That would be an amazing thing to an experience. Yeah. So, and, you know, people, people don't realize like, you know, before that came along, like baseball and the circus were kind of like the big public spectacle outings people would go to see. Um, and then, you know, bicycle racing became real popular in Europe yep. and then in the U.S. Then they called it velodrome racing, which was on banked track like yep. they do in the Olympics and in the World Games. And then, you know, they started realizing, this, here's the history, that, um, that they needed some, they start those bikes or direct drive, the bicycles are, and they needed someone to pace them that was faster than the racers and they couldn't find anybody. So they started strapping a gasoline engine to a pace bike and the next thing you know, the motorcycle was born and then they started getting the bicycles off the track and racing the motorcycles. And, um, and that's where board track racing came from. And people don't realize in 1910, 1915, there was gravel roads in this country and those bikes were made to go 20, 30 miles an hour on a gravel road, which is sketchy at that speed on a gravel road. And, um, they found out that a banked wooden surface was the place where you could go twice that speed and three times that speed. And, um, and board track racing, started and i would love to go see that too i mean those those you know and the tracks were all built along the railroads because that's where the wood was you know they could get yep. the motorcycles from milwaukee and springfield and chicago to the tracks and they would deforest an area along the railroad 
and put a put a board track up and um you know it's just an amazing an amazing time and you know, it was like a flash in the pan and it was gone well it, it was gone because unfortunately the you know, the race organiza- organizers they didn't do a good job maintaining those tracks. I mean, yeah. there's stories up. There's stories of guys going along, and all of a sudden the boards go out from under them, and the guys going head first and getting killed on the track. Yeah, you yeah. Know? And, it, and then that was sad because it became, and for some spectators and maybe for the promoters as well, it became less about the race and more about the the danger factor. Yeah, they had a big accident in New Jersey. I, I think it was. I want to say it was in 1912. Um, yeah, was that a wild one? Um, it might have been. Yeah. Um, it was, but um, I know that several people were killed. It was a pretty horrific yep. accident, and um, you know the motorcycle went up into the into the bleachers. And they had gas lighting, and it hit a gas light, and you know the bleachers caught on fire, and people were burned, and um, you know, it, and it was horrible. And they started calling it a murder drone instead of a motor drone, and um, you know it started to get a bad rap, and. Um, you know, and by 1930, the Great Depression hit, and no one could afford to do anything anyhow, and which might be sure. where we're headed. <laughs> might be where we're headed. And so, yeah, they started racing the dirt tracks because that was the only thing that was affordable to maintain. Yeah, let's hold on and let's hope that that's not going to be the case. You know, yeah. we want to keep having the fun that we have and do the things yeah. we do. Yeah. So, um, so I noticed um, you did a pretty cool helmet with Kirsch for. Uh, yeah, for your sons of speed. So, um, you got together with Donnie, and uh, who came up with that design? Um, I mean, you know, they basically presented a bunch of different designs to us. You know, to go through this, really their design. But I mean, you know, I, I don't want to be involved in anything I don't like. Um, and we're happy to have them on board as a sponsor because until this year, this is the fifth year we've raced Sons of Speed. But until this year, we didn't have any sponsors. You know, we had been going to the loan. Right. And then I brought Andy George on, um, and he's part of the team now, and thank God. And, uh, you know, we've got quite a few sponsors, which is great, because now we can really grow. I was, I was resistant to all that because I wanted it to – I didn't want it to lose the real feel. Um, you know, we weren't able to do a lot because of the, you know, there wasn't any money, but um, at the same time, it had a real grassroots feel to it and really built around the racers. And, you know, now we have sponsors and we can grow it, but we've kept it pure for so long that I don't think it would could turn into something else. Well, that's kind of what we're doing here. We haven't taken on sponsors. We're not, uh, we're not monetizing it because we want it to be real. And we want people to see that how we're doing it is the way to do it, that people will engage, people will enjoy this. You take on sponsors too early, then they want to start tell, you know, trying to dictate the rules, how things are going to be. We don't want to do it anybody's way. We want to do it our way. Yeah. And that's you. Yeah. And that's the so. thing is, you know, that's, we're not dependent on our sponsors. We, the great thing about Sons of Speed was, like when I started it, I, I, I was going to, you know, I know people race vintage bikes at a lot of the antique meets, but I was trying to avoid that crowd on purpose because I, I, what I wanted to do was bring the vintage racing to a crowd that wasn't already familiar with it, which was like the bike week crowds, you know, because the bike, like Daytona bike week crowd doesn't you go to the antique motorcycle meets where they race. No, they don't. So, you know, we wanted to bring that awareness out um, and also to a younger crowd because the antique meet crowd is generally an older white guy crowd. Yeah, that's uh, true. More, you know, we wanted to bring it to a more diverse crowd. Um, and so it, I knew that nobody was going to have any bikes, so I was prepared to build every motorcycle and own them and put people on the race. And that was really how it started. And then, you know, Shelly Rossmeyer, uh, Peppy from, you know, Rossmeyer, Harley Davidson, Daytona yep. got, got involved. And so the first several months, it was Shelly and I out on the track, you know, with our two bikes and just racing around the track and getting used to do it. And I was learning about how to make it faster and faster and how to get the gearing right. And then, you know, we ended up bringing in like Rick Petco joined, my brother joined, and all of a yeah. sudden we started having people come in. And I wasn't having to carry all the weight myself, um, but most of it. And, and, and so it grew from that simplicity to where it is now without any sponsors. So I was like, you know, and we started making our first event, we made money. I mean, it wasn't making a ton of money because it's expensive to do it, but we didn't, 
make a profit. And I was like, okay, I can do this without relying on anybody. And so we've only grown at the rate that we can afford to grow, which is, I think, what's kept it really cool. You know, other events I've seen grow real fast and take on the sponsors and the sponsors start to run the ship and call yep. the shots. And then it starts to look like everything else the sponsors do. Yeah. And that's, 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 that, that's your, that's their death. Typically. Yeah. So, you know, keep your vision. If your vision's working and you see it tracking the right way, don't let anybody take your vision from you. And that's, I think that's one thing that's pretty remarkable about you is that, you know, you've managed to do that with everything you've done in this industry. Uh, Choppers Inc., you know, now you've got the cool hand, you've got this going on with the races and stuff like that, you know, getting back into the parts, doing everything else. You do it Billy's way and Billy's way works. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, I appreciate you saying that, but uh, you know, if, I don't want people to think it's my way or the highway. It's not so much that it's like, I, I, I maintain um, being genuine, you know? Um, and that's sure. the thing that has carried me all these years is that, you know, I could have sold out a lot of times um, and I haven't. And just remain genuine, remain true. And, you know, there's times when you get off track a little bit and you got to look, step back and say, hang on a second. You know, how, how does that, how's that going to taste a year from now or two years from now? And, and like I was saying, when we first started talking about my kids, you know, I, 25 years from now, I have to be still doing this. I have to be relevant. I have to, I have to create a path, you know, for myself because nobody else is going to do it in 25 years. So I have to f navigate it and figure it out and create what I can for myself and faking it isn't going to get me that far, you know? <laughs> so yeah. I, I gotta, I gotta be real. And, and that, I do that with everything I do, you know, um, with Sons of Speed. And, and that's why the people that are in Sons of Speed are in it because they're real too. And that's one of the things I love about Sons of Speed is to do that. You have to, you can't fake that. You just no. can't. Um, those bikes are so fast and you, you can't see bikes like that go that fast anywhere on the planet except like Bonneville and El Mirage. Yep. I mean, that, that's, that's and, then, and then there's no spectator arena there to see it. No, no one goes, I appreciate it. you're right. Very few people go to there, there except people that are running the, you know, mm -hmm. um, running through the traps. So, that's what I like about this is you, if you're a bike week and you want to go to a bike show or you want to go do this or do whatever, you can stop by for a couple hours and see what we're doing on the track. And it's like nothing you've ever seen. And you're watching real people do real stuff with real motorcycles. And then you can go about and, and watch everything else too. You can watch the light and stereo show on main street. If that's what makes you happy. Right. So. Absolutely. So any other plans? I mean, you said, you mentioned Sturgis, any other plans? California, Texas, you know, Northeast. So when <laughs> March, 2020, we, I had worked the, probably the six months prior to that getting, we were going to do AMA vintage days. We were talking about doing a race in Laconia. We were looking at venues in Las Vegas and California um, and possibly Texas. And then COVID hit, we had a great race in March, 2020. We raced the first week in a bike week. And then by the week, the Wednesday of Daytona bike week, COVID hit and just changed, you know, changed everything for all of us. Sure. So um, we are circling back around now and looking at some of those opportunities again, you know, right now. So we race in March in Daytona. I'm going to make this May event in Tennessee an annual event. We want to start racing again in Sturgis in August and then race in October in Daytona. So that's four evenly spaced out events. Um, yeah, California is a hard place to race. And because insurance is so high, it's really that hard. Sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and, uh, you know, the furthest west you can get that doesn't crush you is probably Nevada. So we're, we're, you know, looking at something like that. But, I, you know, there's a lot of great bikes out on the West Coast. So I don't want to exclude that crowd. But the West Coast crowd generally doesn't come too far east. And yeah, I'm, that's why I was asking about California and the West Coast, you know, because yeah. it, there is a lot of great bikes out that way. So um, now let's go, you know, I want to back it up again, back to Sturgis. Uh, I understand you're going to be leading the Legends ride this year. Yeah, I'm pretty stoked to do that. Um, so you want some Z-Max oil in your face? <laughs> I'll be up front. 
shooting it out the pipes of one of these motorcycles for sure. I'll probably ride one of the cool hand bikes on that ride. Um, oh, that's cool. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I'll be, on, know, I'll be on that ride again. So yeah, we're looking forward to it. Really, really looking forward to it. It's been, a, a, I haven't been on the legends ride. Gosh, I'm trying to think of how long ago it's been. It's been a few years. All right. Yeah. I got a piece of art that I, well, I've done it. Uh, this will be third year in a row. I've got a piece they'll do. So I think I'd be for a five grand last year. I'm hoping it does better this year. So nice. I like the fact, you know, I like, I like what, uh, you know, what he does good things with that money and, you know, he plays it forward through that ride. Yeah, they do so much good stuff out there at Buffalo Chip. I'm telling you, I mean, I, I said something to Woody, and I wasn't just trying to butter his bread because he doesn't need that a few years ago. But I was like, man, it's because I'd been going there for camping there so many years ago, and it's grown so much. And it went from just being a wild party to like a really well organized, well maintained, amazing place to be with just, you know, a, a collective. You know, there's a few places like that out there, but. Woody certainly did that with the chip, but it's really amazing when you go there what what they do. I mean, they they pull together, they turn a prairie into um, like a, a city, you know, like a small town. Yeah, it's great. yeah. We I had a lot of fun there a couple uh, a while back. Here, I was taking the county car guys when I worked for, uh, and we would uh, bring the county car guys out there doing stuff, and that was that was a lot of fun, you know, mixing up with the crowds and everything. So. Yeah, but yeah, you know what that's like. That's that's you know, you are you're definitely an attention getter. You know, people want to meet Billy Lane, so I um, really encourage you know. So obviously, you know, we talked about you guys can you know come out and see you can come out to the crossroads and see you. Yeah, and uh, you know, come out to Deadwood because Deadwood's where the ride takes off from. Um, you know, if guys want if you want to be part of that. Uh, ride you can do the package where you know can sit down uh, have lunch with you and uh, a couple other celebrities i think my buddy earl dotson i got him involved last year he played for the packers uh, i think he'll be out there you have you haven't met earl yet have you i have not you'll you'll like earl uh, earl played 10 years for the pack he's a he's a good guy so you'll you'll really enjoy meeting him he's he's a solid guy yeah so uh but yeah Folks could come out and get pictures and meet Billy there as well. And it's just a, that's a great time. Yeah. You know, and then the thing about it is, um, you know, like I was saying about the Buffalo chip and even a ride like that, you know, you meet people when you, when you do stuff like this, that you just don't know what that's going to turn into, what kind of relationship or friendship that's going to turn into. And even if it's, I, I'm in contact with so many people that I met 10, 15, 20 years ago, you know, on something like that or at the Buffalo chip or, you know, at another event in Sturgis or Daytona Bike Week, and I mean, that's what I said earlier. I got in, I got into motorcycles for the people. If I got into it for the money, I would have quit a long time ago. You know, luckily I've I've survived and done well in this business, but you know, there was no money in the bike business for a long, long time, and you know, I really got into it for the people. And that's still why I'm in it. I mean, um, I could at this point probably cash everything in and flip houses or something. You know. <laughs> <laughs> sure, it's a little bit easier life, but I, I, I still really love the people who genuinely, genuinely love this. And um, you know, one of the cool things is, you know, I was on Discovery Channel, you know, from regularly, you know, from 2002 to uh, 2006. Um, you know, only a four-year span. A lot of people who were watching me on TV then were 12, 15 years old. You know. So you look 20 years later, now they're 32, they're 35 years old, they're riding. You know, back then they were just kids and, you know, dreaming about maybe being able to do that someday. And now they're people who are in charge of their own lives and, you know, running their own businesses or, you know, working a successful job somewhere. And they're like still, you know, remembering what we were doing in 2002, 2006. See, now that's amazing. You just brought that up because you just perfectly segmented into what I wanted to ask you, you know, and. I was going to bring up the fact that, you know, there was you and Indian Larry doing the show, you know, Mondo, you know, the, you know, Dave Perowitz, the various people that were coming on the show, being part of these shows, being involved with these people and everything else. OK. And you were kind of a young guy on the block. OK. Had tons of respect from all those guys. Now that you're now that you're older. OK. And you, and you look back, you look at these younger builders who stands out for you these days. I mean, um, there's a, a lot of guys like, um, 
like Rick Bray. I don't know if you know who Rick Bray is. You love like, Rick Bray. He, he builds awesome stuff. I love his work. And um, uh, like um, Nick from Forever Two Wheels, Maine. I don't know if you know yep. who he is up in Maine. Does yeah. really great Nick, stuff. And, Nick was with us last year at Sturgis. So, yeah, so you know, I mean, I, I, and I, I walk up to those guys. I don't know who they are. And I walk up with them. I love your bike. You know what I mean? And, um, and it's pretty cool to see young guys that's just a couple there's a lot of guys you know um like uh oh, shit what's his name um the dude's out there he's i think he's in in reno um uh well mondo's not he's not a young guy i mean he's in reno. <laughs> he's in his like, come on <laughs> no but i mean you know there's 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 a lot but those are two that just come to mind you know my, i'm friends with xavier muriel i mean he's yeah he's doing really great stuff and i mean and I told him because he's sometimes I think he thinks I'm just because we're friends. I'm like, no, man, listen, like he just built the FXR and it's amazing. It's like, beautiful. I said, I said in a world of ugly, but ugly FXRs that I, I think are hideous. And I'm talking to a lot of people. I'm going to piss a lot of people off, but I, you know, that's the way I am. I'm not a big fan either. So we're in the same boat there. Yeah, man. Like the Sons of, Sons of the Anarchy is over. But, um, you know, he built an FXR that reminded me of, I told him it reminded me of when Paul Yaffe did, um, what was that bike that Yaffe did that was like uh, copper color, um, that, that real stretched out soft tail. Um, oh, God, yes. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I know I, what you're talking about. I'm drawing a blank. Gosh, I can't even name it. But what, like, what Xavier did with that FXR reminded me of what Yaffe did with that bike where it was like nobody had ever seen anything like that before, you know? And it was like, um, I was real proud of him, you know? Um, so, I mean, there's a lot, definitely a lot of other guys too, but there's just ones that come to mind, you know, that I, right away that I've recently seen. And that's another kid, um, gosh, trying to go what, what his name is, but he did this really cool twin carb knucklehead. I saw it Sturgis a few years ago. And, um, you know, and I, when I see stuff like that, I'll post it on my Instagram and Facebook. And mm -hmm. I just, hey, look at this. It's, I love seeing you know, really, really cool stuff. And then I see like the, all the old car parts people are using, which, you know, is kind of came from me. And um, yeah, I, I mean, it's really cool to see that. Um, Cause you know, when I, I, I didn't foresee my trajectory, you know, I just th they didn't foresee it. And um, still every day wake up and be like, wow, this has been a pretty, pretty amazing ride. You know, me and Jesse James were talking about it the other day. Like I was telling Jesse, I said, man, do you realize it's getting to be 20 years that we shot, you know, Monster Garage. Because we shot that, right. we shot that November 2001. And um, the week before and after Thanksgiving in 2001, and that was right after September 11th. You know, so think of how the world changed. September 11th hit. And, wow. That's and so true. Flying into, flying into LAX, just flying anywhere was crazy. And flying into LAX. And then... Um, trying to fly back out of there for Thanksgiving was, it was nuts. But we were talking about just how crazy it is. That was, you know, over 20 years ago now. Um, and then, so like this time, 20 years ago, we were filming biker build off of Roger Borget, which was the first biker build off. And I was filming yeah. that at this time, 20 years ago. Um, and that show aired in September of 2002 you know, and then on and on and on. And then, so um, that's something I'm doing a lot of is I'm going back and I've always taken a lot of photographs. I don't have a lot of video, hardly any video from back then, but I have, you know, the video from the show, but I have a YouTube channel and I've been doing a lot of stuff on YouTube and I'm going to go back and for all of those shows that are hitting their 20 year birthday, start going back and showing parts of those shows and talking about what was actually happening, you know, behind the scenes on my end. Um, right. You know, like Dave Perowitz and I are, you know, next year will be 20 years that that show came out and yep. Dave and I were talking in bike week, you know, about it. And he and I were talking about sitting down together and watching it together. Cause I don't that know. Would what be was, fun. Yeah. I don't oh, know. You, what gotta, you gotta, you guys gotta film that. That there's a, there's a YouTube show right there to put yeah. on your YouTube. You guys sit down, you know, put the show on, have a camera, you know, showing the show and the camera showing you guys and your reactions and talking about the show. I mean, I, I'm sorry. I'd watch it all day long. 
Yeah, I mean, and so I'm going to do this on my YouTube because I have a lot of documentation, like um, paperwork the network would send me, um, photos we took while we were building those bikes. I'm talking about print photos. You know, we were still printing photos back then. But yeah. of building those bikes. And um, so, you know, I'm sitting, like my brother helped me on the first biker build off against Roger Borgette and Nick who worked for me and sit with those guys and talk to them about what's happening because everybody has a different perspective. And then what they, sh what they edit it and show you on those shows isn't always really how everything actually happened. And there's things, you know, I can point out to people are stupid little details that people have pointed out to me over the years they can elaborate on and it really illuminate those because there was a, that was a magical time in the bike business. You know, there, there'll probably never be another time like it. And um, yeah, I don't know if we'll ever recapture that. Yeah. So, um, you know, and uh, so anyhow, you know, I'm going I'm to do that. And like the people that I can definitely, like I still talk to Hugh King who produced those shows and you know, we mm -hmm. talk regularly and, um, and, and, you know, he has a whole different perspective on the way things were too, because like, I'll tell you a perfect example. People don't know this. The very first biker build off was going to be motorcycle mania three. And oh, really? yeah, they, so Dave Nichols, the editor, of easy rider magazine yeah. called me. I was, it was like the week before Daytona bike week. I was in Daytona beach getting a bike title at the DMV and I was got in my truck. You know, I had the bike in the back of my truck and I was heading back to Melbourne, which is where I lived at the time. And yep. there was like five missed calls from Dave Nichols. I'm like, what the hell is going on? You know? So, um, and I always, you know, we had a great relationship that mag easy rider magazine helped me, you know, easy rider and, and the horse iron horse magazine, you know, helped me more than, just about anybody, you know, besides the Discovery Channel and, and up to the Discovery Channel. So when Dave called, I would call him back and I'm like, I missed five calls from Dave Nichols. So I call him back and he's like, hey, man, you're sitting down. I'm like, yeah, I'm sitting down driving, you know, and he said, well, um, Discovery Channel is going to make Motorcycle Mania 3 about you and your shop. I'm like, what? And I said, I'm getting ready to go to Daytona Bike Week. He goes, yeah, they want to they wanna, um, come start filming as soon as you get back from Bike Week. I'm like, great, you know, and then there was an issue that I don't, it was never really explained to me, but he, me and Hugh King went and got a 12 pack of Budweiser. We sat down on two egg crates on my floor in my shop and he goes, listen, he goes, they still want to make a show with you, but it can't be, it can't be motorcycle mania. I think they had already started making motorcycle mania three with okay. Jesse and that there was some kind of issue there. I don't know, but we came up with the concept for biker build off. And so we, Hugh and I sat there and literally made a list of guys who we thought would be great for the show, you know, and who, who should be on the show. And, um, you know, I had no control, but like, I wanted Indy and Larry, you know, that's who I wanted. Uh, sure. But, uh, you know, so we literally sat there and figured out, okay, we're going to make a show where we, two builders build a custom chopper and ride it to an event and judge it. And that became Biker Bill Off. And people don't know that, you know, so, I'm telling them now on, on, you know, on your program, but you know, like I would have that discussion because you know, when they started, we probably filmed for a week, thought we were doing motorcycle mania three. And then all of a sudden, okay, stop everything we're doing. We get, we're going to figure this out. And then the next thing you know, I remember Hugh walked in and he's like, okay, we're going to build it with Roger Borgett. And, um, you know, and that's cool. Yeah. And like, we did that bike in two weeks. I think two and a half weeks, whatever. And then next thing you know, we're riding North Carolina in pouring rain. Shows so you what you could do with it. What's that? There's a lot to share there. You know what I mean? Because I was there. I lived it. I, I know what was happening. I have photos that I can, you know, show people. And this is what was going on. And, um, you know, so there's a, and the same with Parowitz can, you know, and, and Roger Borget can. And, and uh, you know, Larry, Larry, we'd have to probably talk to Kano and Paul Cox, um, yep. you know, for the moment, Larry, you know, that's, that'd be next year, but there's just, you know, it's a, a lot, a lot of opportunity to remind people of how special that time was and um, how that brought, it changed the bike industry and brought a lot of people together. Well, you know, I think it was one of those shows, you know, there used to be, you know, you go back to the seventies and, you know, um, people had shows that they just had to be there to watch. Okay. But those yeah. were, you know, some show that was written, be it, you know, something silly like Love Boat or Fantasy Island or whatever else, or, you know, the, yeah. the latest sitcom that was hot. This was something that was so unique. It yeah. was so special because it was, 
it was real. Okay. Yeah. You know, nobody was going to go live love, but nobody's going to go, you know, be Archie Bunker, you know, on a comedy. Nobody's going to be this. All right. But everybody felt like they could be a part of what you guys were and what you were doing. You know, they could be yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that was, it was really, really amazing, you know, and, and that's the thing is like, by the time we filmed the last biker build off I did in 2006, I was already ready to write them discovery off in 2005. I was so sick of the whole thing and, and people don't know that either. You wouldn't see that watching that show and, and how a lot of these things materialized and so many things that happened along the way. So, you know, I want to try and share that with people because I think they really, really enjoy, um, it's almost like watching behind the music on VH1, you know, um, about sure. some of these bands and things that happened. I mean, it's, I do that type of thing where I share with people a lot of things they just wouldn't know from watching those shows. Well, it's, it's the novelty too. So, you know, there's been so much time that's gone by and you have that novelty. It's like an old toy that you had as a kid. All right. You go to an antique store and you see it now. And you're like, this is cool. I had one of these. Yeah. Now, you know, to watch this show, it's kind of that same novelty. You revisit it, you know, you reconnect with something that brought you a lot of pre yeah. pleasure, yeah. enjoyment, stuff like that. I really love that. That's that's really awesome. Yeah, you know, and, th and that was the thing where it, it, the timing of it all too, like Discovery, you know, before they did Biker Build Off, like Steve Irwin was like the first yeah. huge star on, on cable TV. Like yes, first TV star. And then, you know, then they did Motorcycle Mania with Jesse. And Jesse became, you know, a huge star. And rightly so, because Jesse has a, like a, <laughs> a star quality about him that, you know, hate him or whoever people, some people don't like him, but um, is amazing. You know, and he's an amazing craftsman. And he's also one of the people who stayed very true to himself, you know. And then, you know, and then the, the night that my first biker build off air with Roger Borgett, was the same night that American Chopper aired. And, um, you know, and then all of a sudden there was this whole, there was three motorcycle shows on Discovery Channel and people realized there's an appetite for this. And, you know, Discovery was feeding it, feeding it with a pitchfork. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And also spawned, you think about the businesses that got launched because all of a sudden everybody was trying to build choppers for everybody too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, a lot of disasters are out there that people are trying to deal with today, but you know, yeah. hey, it is what it is. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it, you know, but that was a necessary byproduct of what was happening. But you know, like that was the thing is that you know, I, I think that now, like, I look at all the people that I met and that were in business, say in two thousand and three or two thousand and four, that aren't in it anymore. You know, or doing something else really primarily, and maybe the bikes yeah. is a hot. Um, you know, I've always, I was, I, the, the thing about me was I was truly doing this, you know, since the late eighties, um, you know, and I, I, I knew then that it would change things for me and I, I had to try and be in control of that in some way, but I, that I wasn't going to let it change me, you know, and I well, stayed, stayed the same. You know, the thing is, Billy, you've never, you know, you weren't that person that was taking advantage of the fad. You were one of the people that pioneered and created the fat. You are the fat. You know, you and Jess and, Ian and other people, you created this. Okay. Uh, you know, and I know you didn't do it necessarily intentionally. Like, hey, we're going to go be a part of this show. And then Choppers is going to become the hottest thing on the planet. And everybody, not only in the United States, but across the world, is going to want a chopper. Yeah. yeah. But you, but you were that, you, you were that key figure. You were that galvanizing personality which you still are i mean you know the dreadlocks are gone some other things are gone you know you now have your family and you know and i love seeing the things you know how devote you are as far as a family man and and your kids you know it's just it's really come full circle i'm sure life is far you know really fulfilling for you now yeah it is i mean it is and, and i i got to a point to where i thought i probably wasn't going to get married and have kids not because i didn't want to but i just i didn't see you know um the opportunities that were unfolding in front of me didn't kind of predict that, but um, yeah. things happen. And, and like, I mean, I love, you know, like right now, every decision I make back then, it used to be, how does it affect my business? You know, now it's, how does it affect my kids? You know, um, sure. so, uh, you know, it's a whole, definitely a different perspective, but 
I mean, I, no regrets. And, and uh, you know, I, I don't ever expect to have things go back to the way they were, but who would want things to go back to the way they were? Um, but they're good now, you know, and, and, uh, and, and people still love motorcycles. You know, they still love them. And I mean, Harley Davidson is still in business. And, they're uh, still going. Uh, and people are still buying old Harleys and customizing old Harleys. And I, I see choppers now having a resurgence again. You know, you've been yeah. around for a long time, but I mean, a lot of people don't know, but I mean, I've seen them come and go five, half a dozen times maybe. Well, you know, we did that. I did that thing last year on the Chopper Show page on Facebook. We did that uh, virtual bike show. You did your hubless in that, remember? Yeah. yeah. And I was I was blown away. You know, you brought up Ricky Bray. I mean, think about Ricky Bray says, hey, I want to put this bike in. And that was one of the bikes that was lost in his uh, shop fire. You know, yeah. So a lot of the people in the, around the world, they never saw that bike. Okay, yeah. but it got to be part of kind of a virtual bike show. It was it was very cool, and I was I was rather stunned how well that went over. I mean, yeah. and we're gonna be doing that. We'll be doing that again, and we've got it coming up. When we do it again, it's gonna have some cash money behind it as well. So that'll be very cool. I ride my my blue shovelhead chopper. It was on the cover of Easy Rider, I think, in October '01 or '02. Um, twenty years, twenty years, I was like '02 because it's. 20 years ago. No, October 2001. And it was on the cover of the Horse Magazine, I think, before that. And, and then when I ride it, people still freak out. Like, sure. you know, oh my God, that bike's amazing. And um, it really kind of blows me away because you don't see bikes like that anymore. And when I built that bike, you didn't see bikes like that back then either. You know, people were still kind of riding um, Arlen Ness. Uh, you know, FXRs and Donnie Smith Pro Street stuff yep. was still, you know, and, the, and a lot of people who are watching may not understand what that is, but, you know, like the, the fads that were going on back then were way different. And, you know, like stretched gas tank soft tails with ta tail dragger fenders were still, you know, I built this bike in the late 90s. And, um, you know, it wasn't really until Jesse did Motorcycle Mania that the chopper craze, you know, shifted into high gear and, you know, it went nuts, but, um, so it's kind of cool because when I built it, nobody was into bikes like that. And now nobody's, you know, they're not really building wide, wide tire choppers. It's got 240 no. in it. And, um, but it, I ride it and people still respond to it, you know, in traffic, they'll honk the horn and be like, Hey, what's up? You know, and not because they know it's me, but because they like the bike. Well, you know, one of the most, one of the most iconic pictures from that period to me is you on the hub list with Shepard laying through the wheel. Oh, yeah. And that's, I mean, that's a cool ass picture. There's just no two ways about that. Yeah. And we, so we shot that right at the Iron Horse Saloon. Um, that dog belonged to the owners of the Iron Horse Saloon in Daytona. And okay. we got the, the pictures in their warehouse because Michael wanted to shoot the bike. And, um, and that was, God, you know, 2003. And, uh, it, you know, March 2003, which I don't, people probably don't remember, but it poured rain during bike week that year. It rained every day. And I don't mean for an hour here and there, but I mean it rained all day, every day for like 10 days. And bike week was a ghost town. We debuted the bikes at the Camel because I built a bike for Camel, for the Camel Roadhouse, for RJ Reynolds. And, um, and again, the timing, you know, we built that bike and then bike week was a washout. So Mike was like, well, let's go shoot it, find a place to shoot it. So we shot it in that warehouse, and the, their dog literally just walked up and laid down in that wheel. It wasn't posed or anything. It was just the dog oh, that's saw it. Cool. Yeah, everybody was on one side of the bike looking at the wheel, and you know, there was probably a dozen people there, and the dog walked up and laid in, in the hole and just looked through, and Michael started snapping. It's kind of neat. No kidding. Uh, yeah. that, that's awesome. That, yeah. I didn't know that story about it. So, yeah. at, the, at the same time, we were – we, I'm sorry. What? I was going to say, you know, Michael will, you know, he remembers exactly every photo and how it all goes too. Yeah. yeah his eyes, just amazing. But you know, at the same time we were doing that, we were filming Biker Build Off with, um, with Dave Perowitz. Yeah. Cause that was, uh, we filmed February, March, April, 2003. So literally we were going from bike, they told a bike week in March to the Dallas easy rider show, which was, I think around April, the 5th or 
something like that in early April in 2003. And I had just moved my shop from one. I mean, we had so much stuff going on. Um, you know, and things were really taking off because we'd already done the first biker build off. And, um, and that had aired in September 2002. And then, you know, people knew we were filming another one. And the motorcycle mania was driving the bike business. So, I mean, just a lot of stuff happening at once. I mean, it was really kind of amazing time to think about. Absolutely. That, that is so cool. So, and when I think about that, that's what I say. When I think about that picture, it just reminds me of all that. Like, I don't know why, but that one photo makes me think about all of that. That bike in general does, but um, especially that photo. Because I remember, like, I didn't even want to go. I was like, God, I, I just want to go home. I don't even want to go. I'm so tired. I don't even want to go do a photo shoot. But every time Michael ever asked to take a picture of anything, I said yes, um, because it's the right thing to do. And, uh, but you know, it's like, ah, I just want to go home, but I, and it ended up being such an amazing photo that we're talking about, you know, 19 years later. Exactly. You know, it's, it stands out and I know that stands out for a lot of people and stuff. We'll have to, I'll have to grab that photo and we'll have to throw it up. Maybe we'll use that as something to talk about the announcement of, uh, you know, this and everything leading in or let people know to come watch this. So, so um, I don't want to take up, I mean, we've already taken up a lot of your time and we didn't even cover some of the things I'd want to eventually talk with you. So maybe we'll circle back around after Sturgis or next fall um, sure. when you get some other things going on. But we end, we end every show um, with three questions. It's our three W's, who, what, and where. Um, and it's, uh, I think for you, this is going to be, it's going to be interesting to hear you um you know, give your answers. I think people really be fascinated by that. Um, first one, I mean, people have literally named you as being the person. Um, if you could ride with anybody, dead or alive, okay, um, who would you like to go ride with? Man, um, I mean, I'm going to say Indy and Larry. Um, even though I, I, I'd already ridden with them, I, I just, I think about them every day. And uh, um, just really admired him as a person and looked up to him before I met him and then got to know him. So, um, I mean, it's a hard question, but just off the top of my head, that's who pops in right away. You know, um, sure. I've ri ridden with him a lot, but I, I think one more ride would be, <laughs> would be pretty epic. Absolutely. No, that, that, makes, that makes a lot of sense. This question, too, is, I think it's going to be fascinating when it comes to you. Um, if you could own, have any bike, any bike out there, all right, it's ever been made, what would that be for you? I'm going to piss some people off, but probably a Vincent Black Shadow. Um, I mean, and I'll tell you why. So I've owned. 37, 38, 30, I think I've owned it pretty much every year knucklehead ever built, um, which is probably as high as you can go when it comes to Harleys. Had a couple yeah. pretty rad Indians. Um, I, I do own a Crocker. Um, yep. I have a rare Harley race bike sitting right here that they only made 12 of, you know, in the thirties. Um, so I had a Vincent single cylinder, a badass one and I loved it, but it wasn't a twin and the singles are a little mm -hmm. low on power. So I think a Vincent Black Shadow would be would be it for me. One of the most beautiful things I ever seen was a '52 Vincent, just <laughs> absolutely gorgeous. I mean, what a what a bike! And uh, I actually told somebody a while back ago that would be the bike for me. Yeah. So that's that's uh, that's pretty cool. That's really cool. Yeah. And then last, I mean, you've ridden all over the place. You've seen a lot of places, done a lot of stuff. But where would where would you like to go ride that you've not ridden before? Man, um, probably Australia. I'm dying to go to Australia. Um, I know they have a great bike scene there. They do. Um, and uh, I mean, I've ridden in Europe. I've ridden in Asia. I've ridden North America, Central and South America, Hawaii. I've ridden. Um, and uh, I think I think I'd like to ride in Australia. I think it's a place I'd really like to spend some time. You know, that's definitely on my on my list of uh, places I, I want to hit. I want to take the wife and at some point and do that. Okay, we're similar. I'd, I'd like to do New Zealand, but uh, 
down in that part of the world. And, uh, that would be a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I you know, love to, and I just, I have some friends there and I have friends have been there and, um, and, uh, I think it's the place that, that, my gosh, you know, for people who the United States has got some amazing writing too. I mean, um, oh, it does. I, there's, a, my wife really hasn't been a lot of places and I've always, you know, she'll see like, um, say something, uh, you know, in the Caribbean, like a commercial, um, uh, for sandals or something like, yeah, that's all great. But there's some amazing places here in the U S I mean, especially if you like to ride, gosh, it's a good ride here. So. I mean, right where I live in Tennessee, the writing here is phenomenal. Um, oh, the writing's phenomenal. You, you you moved to Tennessee a couple of years ago. It's beautiful. There's so many cool destinations in Tennessee, yeah. too. Yeah. You know, that's what a lot of people, I mean, you can just jump on a bike and go over to Loveless and get some good food, you know. Yeah. Try those biscuits. So really, really good stuff. So um, any other future plans or things that uh, you got in the works that uh, you might like to tell people about? No, you know, um, I mean, I'm excited. Like I said, I am going to go back into the parts business with Choppers Inc. Cool Hand Speed Co. I got 50 bikes to build. Well, not 50 anymore, but almost 50. So that's going to keep me busy for a little bit. Um, I've got a few chopper projects on deck here. Um, you know, and uh, just kind of seeing where all this takes me. I mean, uh, my YouTube channel, I'm you know really excited about that. Just Billy Lane YouTube channel. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of people are connecting with me there from that knew me and I see it every day and I, I, you know, I try and interact with the, the people who are viewing me there, but, um, you know, it's a lot of people who's like, Oh my gosh, I used to watch you on biker build off. And, uh, so it's a really great venue for me to show off what I'm doing. Um, and I'm learning a lot there, but that's really, really it. I mean, I'm going to definitely continue doing the YouTube stuff and, um, you know, if TV ever wants to come back and stick his tongue in my ear, you know, I'll turn my head a little bit. There you go. But, um, you know, I don't, I don't need that. I mean, I've definitely, I've survived long enough without it that I don't need it. But, you know, if they ever decide they want to, they like motorcycles again, that'd be cool to see, you know. Because um, there's a lot of talent out there still, a lot of great talent. You know? There's a lot of great talent. There's no doubt. Um, so if somebody wants to get a, uh, a cool hand bike, what's the best way to reach out on uh, website? Yeah, go to BillyLane.net, or um, and we're working on a Cool Hand Speedco website, or come to Sturgis or Daytona Bike Week. Um, and one of the things I'm doing with those, I didn't really get a chance to elaborate on earlier, is like each bike. I'm I've been filming this since two years ago. Um, all the prototype work I did, building the Cool Hand bikes, building the engines, doing all this stuff. I've been videoing all of it and making videos for YouTube, but I haven't posted anything yet. Until okay. I start delivering these bikes, but each bike will have each cool hand bike that I build will have its own video from start to finish of that bike being built, um, and then there's all the stuff along the way of how I designed the frames and built the frames and built the jigs for the frames and um, you know the gas tanks and everything I'm doing on them and all the stuff for the engines. I mean, it's really really neat documenting all that stuff. So I'm going to share that with with everybody. Um, so I'm really excited about the possibilities that YouTube offers because even there, I'm in control. When we did Discovery Channel, we they filmed us, and we didn't know what we were going to see till we saw it. Right. Whereas with, with this, you know, I can kind of um, I, I know what I want to show you. I, I can, you know, I'm, I'm fairly good at teaching people, so I can kind of, you know, educate you on what's going on and throw in a little history like we talked about and, um, and have fun with it. You know what I mean? And I'm, I'm in control there, so I really, really enjoy being in that space because it's so powerful. I think people are really going to enjoy seeing the world through your eyes and I, and that's what they're going to get. So, um, you know, your, your remarkable talent, your remarkable ambassador for this industry. And I think you're going to continue to be that. So excited to see things, looking forward to seeing you in Sturgis. Uh, you come to the chopper show. I'll be at the School chopper show. show. Yeah. Yeah. I know Mondo and I went to there last year, but you were you were moving into a new house, and who can blame you for that, right? Yeah, well, you know, we had, I mean, we picked the worst time in the world to move. Um, you know, we, we didn't know when our house was going to be done. That was the biggest thing was we didn't know when it was going to be done. It had been 18 months. It was supposed to take six months. It took, I think, not 18, 16 months, I believe. And so we, every month we thought, okay, we're moving this month, and we just really didn't know. And we sure. had, you know, um, just a, a lot invested in it. And we've been living in a little tiny townhouse. 
that wasn't big enough for us and the kids. And you know, the timing ended up being that, you know, it was exactly at that time that we were finalizing our mortgage and get everything done and get moved in. So, um, but I'm excited. I hate missing Sturgis. So I'm excited to go back. Yeah. Looking forward to seeing you there. So Billy, I, Billy, I really appreciate you coming on tonight. This was, was great. I hope everybody enjoys it. I hope they, uh, follow your YouTube channel. Um, Check out your stuff at your web page and everything else. And uh, before we go, is there anything you want to say to folks? No, I just want to say, hey, I, you know, for so many of you who have followed me all these years and supported what I'm doing, I'm really, really grateful. Um, you know, I mean, this is my dream job. You know, I'm still doing my dream job 34 years later. And I want to thank you, Mario, for having me on and be able to talk to everybody and, and share some of this stuff. And I, I welcome the opportunity to come back. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. Y'all have a good evening. Make sure you share this with your friends and uh, subscribe to those YouTube channels. Thank you.